So welcome everyone uh, to our fourth edition of our weekly design principle session. Uh, this is a, a really uh, exciting one. This is something that, again, that started about a month ago. Uh, we've been having a lot of people join. I think we have now 250 people registered to this event, which is always great. Uh, again, from really all over the world, uh, which is one of the things that I love so much about doing these online webinars is, well, of course, we have this global captive audience at home <laughs> these days, but I love it because it's a really level playing field that anyone across the world can really join these and be part of that discussion. So that's really one of the things that I love about doing these uh, online sessions. And of course, it's always great to see so many familiar names uh, in the audience uh, as we have now. For those that are new to the interface, uh, this uh, there's a little ask a question widget at the very bottom. You can use that to ask a question during the webinar. And those uh, questions, I will tackle those uh, at the very end. We're going to have a short QA uh, session on this. Um, as part of this webinar, and I will tackle those questions uh, when that time comes. So you can also vote on other uh, people's questions as well. All right, so let's get started. I'm just going to maximize the screen so you can see it better. Great. So again, this is uh, our fourth edition of our weekly design principles, where we tackle one design principle every week. The goal of these sessions is, is really for us to gather insights and knowledge from cognitive science, right? Specifically from the areas of attention, perception, memory, and emotion. And, and it's really for us to try and translate cognitive behaviors, right? Understanding the human mind into design principles that we can apply in user experience, graphic design, data visualization, and many other related fields. The goal of this is really to empower all of you on the call with a creative toolbox uh, that you can apply in your practice. And this creative toolbox is made up of principles, really, which is a notion that I, I really like in the sense that it gives you this general idea or plan on how to do things, but it's not very specific. It's not very prescriptive, right? It will never tell you step by step what you need to do to do something. It just gives you a high level view on a given way of doing things, right? And what's interesting also about principles, and I think those were the cases uh, that we have done so far, sometimes they just point us, they just point to specific biases and tendencies, cognitive behaviors that we might have as humans, right? Other times, principles give us a few techniques, a few approaches that we could consider in order to fix some of these problems, right? In order to even fight some of these biases, some unwanted biases that we might actually have. So the principle we're gonna cover today is one of those interesting approaches that you can take. And it really applies to various different types of design. Most of the examples that I'm gonna cover are examples of UX design and data visualization, but it really applies on to many different things from architecture to urban planning and so on. And so in case I was <laughs> trying to uh, um, bump your interest a little bit, the session today is really all about progressive disclosure. This is one of the most important principles for interaction design, which again can apply to UX, user experience, and data visualization. And progressive disclosure is really a strategy for managing complexity in which only necessary or requested information is displayed at any given time, right? So this is all about prioritizing the information that matters, right? So it's very related to the 80-20 rule, as we will see. And it's a great way for us to minimize complexity. So this is a it's kind of like an explaining diagram, right? So instead of having a full picture, instead of bombarding users with information, right, with data, right, with, with text, progressive uh, disclosure takes this approach, right? It basically segments, it kind of chunks the information or the data in different segments, right, in different steps, in different processes, and 
progressively displays that to the user. And that could be based on their own proficiency, their level of comfort with information, uh, if they are like more of a novice, more of an advanced user. So you're kind of giving them control over time as well. And of course, it's a great way to manage to digest information, right? Instead of just, again, being overwhelmed with information, you know, we, we go back to our very first principle, X law, right? That the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number of options available, right? And that's a huge problem. And so progressive disclosure is a great way to help us with X law, right? So again, instead of bombarding the user with every single bit of information all at once, we show it in a progressive fashion. So I'm gonna cover a few approaches that are related to progressive disclosure. These are almost like sub-principles or sub-approaches that are under this umbrella of progressive disclosure, right? The first one is a really effective one on UI and UX. It's called the hide and show principle, right? So you can apply this. Hopefully, the the rating, is, the the frame rate is 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 good enough for you guys to have a sense of some of the gifs, some of the animated gifs that are being shown here. But this could be as simple as example on the left, right? Just you know, by clicking a checkbox, all of a sudden there's more options that appear, right? I don't need to see those options because I haven't selected remember me, right? I haven't selected a checkbox. So why bother user, the user with options, right? With information that are not really relevant, right? So this is a great, super simple approach. The right side, it's something that you can really consider when you're doing a long questionnaire, a long survey, right? That you don't, again, need to show all the options and sub options at once. Depending on each individual answer, you can actually display, right? Again, in a progressive fashion, the secondary information, right? So this is another great way of of solving, again, really long, complex uh, forms. The one example on the left is, you know, the very common accordion. I think this has been slightly overused, I would say, in the past. I think 10 years ago, especially on mobile, this was people were really uh, doing a lot of accordions. It can be annoying at times because if you overdo, as with many of these techniques, if you overdo them, right, it becomes annoying on its own, right? <laughs> it's a contradicting principle. So, you know, always take care. But, you know, accordion, when used right, when used in a, with a certain degree, not, not really going, uh, not overusing it, I think it can still be a relevant technique. The example on the right, of course, is just a more sophisticated way of starting up with a, with a simple card that gives you an overview onto something. And then by clicking it, it just expands and shows more information. This is another great example of progressive disclosure, right? Like you don't need to show the complete card, all the entire information all at once in a single feed, right? You can just add this overview card and then you click on it and then it just displays more secondary information. And it's interesting because now the user has shown interest in knowing more about something, which is one of the reasons why I love so much progressive disclosure as a principle, because many of these actions are user initiated, right? So now you're not actually annoying the user with with irrelevant information because he actually made an action. They made an, they shown an intention of knowing more about something. The other, of course, important approach uh, for uh, when it comes to progressive disclosure is the very common stepped approach. And you've seen this in many, many different situations, I'm sure. This is you know, the common scenario. You basically uh, chunk a long form, a long survey, or something that users need to fill into different steps. And sometimes you even label that as at steps, you know, step number one, two, three, four, and so on. So there's a few positives here, right? Now, each step is a lot more digestible, right? There's only maybe a couple of fields to fill instead of just a long, long form. But it also reinforces the user that this is not going to take forever, right? Now, you're also showing, you're giving them the power, right? they're in control of the information that they, they, they have to fill. They know how long this, this is gonna take, right? It's a, it's a three-step process, a four-step process. So they have a sense of how long it will take them to complete such a thing, such a, such a task, right? So this is an example again on, on mobile. 
and hopefully you can see this animated gift where you know you are signing up for a service right and then you have three different steps in this case they don't actually use numbers they use labels and you have contact you have the payment process and then demographic and then that's it right and then you're done but again you kind of know what you are getting yourself into which is another great positive of of this particular stepped approach stepped approach can even have sub steps this is a, an example of a really long form right in this case i would argue that do you really need all of this information to be filled right uh, because now all of a sudden you have five steps on the left side in a vertical sort of uh, uh, lineup and then you have sub steps on the right using tabs you know it's getting a little bit much i think this is a little bit over the top uh, i think it has really it's already passing the threshold of of simplicity by a good amount so in this this is a case where you could argue you know do you really need to prioritize all this information this, do you need to ask the user to fill all of these different steps right but regardless this is an interesting approach on how to use the stepped uh, technique uh, to include even sub steps by means of tabs right and of course the stepped approach and this is something that i really wanted to highlight can be great for narrative for storytelling right for building momentum if you are communicating an idea if you are communicating a concept so if you were here last week when we talked about uh of course the aesthetic usability effect right and the beauty of aesthetics why aesthetics and beauty are so important as part of the usability of a product you probably recall this diagram that i showed where there was like three, a sequence of three slides. There was a buildup where I explained, you know, the major sort of stereotypes, and then I explained this futile quadrant that's not normally uh, noticed by people. And then I ended up with the desirable quad, uh, quadrant, re really what we should all aspire to as designers, right? And of course, I could have done all of that in one single slide, right? And I could explain the same process. Again, this is putting all the information all at once to the user, in this case, to you, my audience, right? And in this case, I could still explain, but of course, two things. It would take me a lot of time to explain it, right? Because now there's a lot of more information for, for me to explain and therefore for you to digest, right? So it's just more complex altogether. And then you wouldn't have the benefit of that buildup, right? Because there's, there's a sense of building momentum, right? Of, of increasing the drama, right? of a storytelling. And that's a really important aspect of this step approach because you can also use progressive disclosure as a great storytelling technique where you don't, again, show things all at once to the user. You're basically building up momentum. And, and you are doing so in a way that's very digestible because each step in that sequence, each step in that narrative is easier to grasp, is easier to understand, right? And it's a lot more digestible. So this is another, a great way of using this tapped approach as a narrative. Now, another interesting technique for progressive disclosure is the leveling system. And we take this, there's multiple examples out there of this. One of my favorites is of course the Duolingo tool. I don't know if you have used Duolingo. Duolingo is a, is a really popular, I think it's only mobile, uh, I believe. I don't know if they, they, they might have a, actually a, a web experience. But, but regardless, it's a great tool to learn languages, Duolingo, right? You, you can look it up. I actually use that to learn. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, at least I, I try to learn. I think that's probably the case uh, with most people using Duolingo. It's like, that's, you know, it's like doing a, a gym membership, right? You are very well-intentioned, but then how many people actually complete that, right? Complete that journey. But regardless, what's really great, yeah. So I see people saying on the chat that they have a web tool. Yes, there's a web interface, so it's great. But the great thing about Duolingo is the sort of the game mechanics that they have embedded in the UI, in the user experience, right? So when you start using Duolingo, right, it asks you, are you, are you a beginner or are you not a beginner, right? But basically you have this map and all of it is deactivated, right? Because it's a map that you need to complete, right? So progressively, as you get more comfortable with a given language, let's say that you're trying to learn French, right? As you progressively get more comfortable with the language, you know they start they start showing you words, combinations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As you start getting comfortable, they 
allow you to unlock new levels, right? Unlock new packages. So you can really see where this is going. This is very much based on games, right? The, the typical game that shows you the different levels, right? And then you kind of unlock them as you, as you navigate through the system, as you sort of get more comfortable and you achieve a given sort of goal, right? So this is a really interesting approach. And I think, to be honest, there's a, a great book on game design, um, by Katie Salem. Um, I forgot the name of the, the book. Uh, maybe someone can recall. Um, but I always felt that game design is an immensely appealing field for all designers to learn from, and specifically UX designers and even people involved in data visualization. Why? Well, because game designers, they really have to know all the rules of play, right? And I, that's actually the name of the book, Rules of Play on how to engage users from the beginning, how to keep them engaged from beginning to end. And this is, again, a great uh, approach that Duolingo has taken by using aspects of game mechanics to keep users engaged, wanting for more. Right now, all of a sudden, I want to complete this specific level to go to the next one, right? So again, some people like myself, this might not even be enough <laughs> because life gets in the way, and all of a sudden, you are really not really learning a language. but but I think it helps a lot of people having that sort of small sort of like uh, hints and 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 sort of uh, um, again part of this uh, game sort of mechanics in place in the in the UI. And like I was saying, so this is very much part of games. These are just kind of like uh, random uh, examples of of maps that you find in most games. Many games have this sort of map that you click on it, and then you can actually see the full. Uh, the full system, what's waiting for you. But of course, many of these things are blocked or unlocked. And, and sometimes, of course, with new games now, they, you actually have to pay <laughs> to access some of these games uh, to some of these levels. But it's a great metaphor because, again, it keeps users motivated. Uh, they want to know, they want to move forward into this map. They want to go to the next level. They want to see what it's all about, right? And they can only do that by continuously playing and continuously unlocking their present level. So it's a great, again, uh, metaphor to apply for UX and data visualization. Now, going more into the domain of data visualization, <clears throat> one great technique is that we can apply under the, the umbrella of progressive disclosure is called semantic zoom. Now, this might seem like a fancy title, but all of you have seen this. You know, All of you probably have used uh, many map applications either on, on your browser or in your phone, right? So semantic zoom is a great, great metaphor for progressive disclosure, right? So when you open, let's say, Google Maps for the first time and you zoom out, you only see the, you see, of course, the globe, which is great, you know, puts things into perspective. Oh, all of us are just part of that sort of small blue, uh, blue marble. But, uh, but it's also the only thing you see are at most uh, just the, the country boundaries, right? The boundaries between territories and countries. As you zoom in into a given location, now all of a sudden you start seeing names of major cities. You start seeing major highways, right? Then if you zoom in further, you start seeing secondary roads, tertiary roads, points of interest, you know, even the silhouettes of different buildings, right? Again, they don't show you all at this at once, right? When you are looking at the blue marble, Otherwise, it would, of course, be completely meaningless, right? It wouldn't be digestible in any way. They do it in a progressive fashion. As the user zooms in, and again, the user has shown interest in knowing more. So now we are allowed to actually display more complementary information, right? So these are just a, a few examples. The one on the left is actually an interesting case where basically they bumble up uh, points of interest and it kind of gives you an indication of how many points of interest are in a given location. But again, th then again, as you continuously zoom in, these keep on changing, right? And a few maps have, have, have done this, have done a similar approach as well. So semantic zoom is a really interesting approach. And again, you can apply this to many different areas. Another one is called focus plus context. And this is a bit of a more uh, kind of academic approach for data visualization that some of you might not be familiar. This was actually very popular in the 90s. 
the, the focus plus context is a technique that basically allows you to display the most important data at the very core, normally at the center. And then the remaining information, the rem remaining nodes, the remaining information is goes to the periphery. So this is actually a very similar approach to the fish islands, right? If you recall, the fish islands it creates a sort of magnified uh, field where the center is very focused on something, and then everything else becomes smaller and moves towards the periphery. So I tried to actually find some videos. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it, but I think these little animated GIFs kind of give you a hint. Again, the idea is that this would be controlled by the user. So this is a great example of direct manipulation. So you would actually be in control. But as you move, as you pan things around, you, you are basically putting one single node, one single piece of information in the center, and then therefore magnifying, seeing it in, in full disclosure. And then, of course, everything else that's not relevant to what you're looking for becomes smaller towards the periphery, right? So this is a great, this is actually called the hyperbolic tree as well. This was, again, a very common practice and kind of a, a research experiment done in the 90s. But it, there's something really appealing about this, this specific approach. And then, and then finally, the navigator view. All of you are, are probably familiar with this with this concept. This is, you know, uh, has, has been has been going on for a while. But the navigator view is you know, something that you even see on Photoshop, right? If you have used Photoshop in the past, you have this navigator view. This was also a view that you had uh, on maps, old maps, at this specific approach, right? Where the zooming was not as easy as we have now, especially on mobile, that you can just like pinch and zoom. But before we had this navigator view, which allows you again, as you zoom in a specific area of the globe, you have context. You always have the context as to where you are. This is called the overview plus detail approach, right? And again, it can apply to many different things as mundane as zooming in a photo or a map. Uh, but it can also be applied to many different charts and areas of data visualization, right? And again, the concept is you have a small kind of contextual overview of the graphic next to a large zoomed and draggable view, right? Where you are actually paying your focus. Uh, you, you are really paying a lot of attention to that specific zoomed area. Now, this applies to, to of course, other areas, as I mentioned, on, on data visualization, right? So sometimes there are specific details, let's say even on a line graph, that you want to look deep into. Right? And you can do this by this, this specific approach, right? this overview plus detail, where basically you can zoom in on that specific uh, line chart that you see on the examples on the, on the right. And now all of a sudden, in the larger view, in the larger window, I'm actually at looking specifically at those details. Right? So this is, again, a, another great example of progressive disclosure. Right? You don't show all the details all at once. Again, it's user-initiated. right? I'm showing interest, I'm zooming in, and now I can actually display secondary information in such a way. The example on the left is actually using an icicle tree. This is a, a, a really interesting, and to be honest, such a great uh, technique to visualize trees that I wonder why it hasn't been used more often. It's a very effective one. In this case, well, it, it's basically, again, as I, as I kind of implied, it's a way of visualizing your hierarchies or trees. So you start with the roots, which is this dark uh, pink um, column on the left. And then there's like the, the successive uh, descendants, right? The different sort of uh, generations. But in this case, you actually I'm looking at that specific slender that is represented by this, by this rectangle here. And then I'm looking on the right side at the very part that's inside that rectangle, right? So it's a very similar approach. Again, and now I have a lot more detail because you lose a lot of detail if, if I was to navigate the left uh, set of columns alone, right? You don't really see what's going on there. But by being able to zoom into that section and kind of knowing where I am, I can navigate this in such a, in such a, uh, in such a way, right? By just moving that rectangle. And all of a sudden, I have all the detail that I need at the very, uh, and, and a much larger view, right? So this is another great example of progressive disclosure. So we went through a bunch of techniques, and I really think a lot of the techniques that we went through, specifically the ones pertaining to data visualization, go back to this uh, mantra by Ben Schneiderman, which I absolutely love. Uh, this is called the Information Visualization Mantra, and this was written a few years back. 
Uh, but I think it makes so much sense, and we can apply this, again, in many other areas of design, including uh, user experience. So it says the following, overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand. Hiding here is a lot of the principles for progressive disclosure, right? You show the overview first, you kind of prioritize what that overview is. Again, you don't really need to show everything. Think about the semantic map. You only show the, the main boundaries between countries, that's it, the overview. Then you can zoom in filter, right? And then details on demand. Again, user initiated. Now you are given, you got, you are given the, the chance to actually display more information, to show the user more information because they are wanting, they are, we, they are uh, very much willing to consume that more detailed information, okay? So overview first, zoom in filter, details on demand. It's a really interesting mantra. Again, it is called the, the data viz mantra, but it really can be applied to many different areas of, of design. So a few other principles for you to consider. Uh, chunking is a really interesting one. We might cover that. It's a very similar idea to progressive disclosure. I'm just chunking, as the name implies, chunking information to be more digestible, right? You can think about a phone number, right, that you use. Why do we have dashes or spaces between digits? Because it's a lot easier for you to memorize three digits at a time than it is a full string of nine, 10, depending on the country where you are. The same thing with credit cards, right? There's they, they, they segment this, they chunk it in, in, uh, in sequences of four digits so that it's easier for you to remember, okay? Or, or even tell that to someone if you are buying something uh, over the phone. Uh, another interesting uh, concept, principle that's related to this is the 80-20 rule. And that's, we're definitely gonna cover this at some point in the near future. It's basically all about understanding what are the top features that users use the most and ways to prioritize those, right? So progressive disclosure can definitely help you do uh, really uh, understand and apply the 80-20 rule. And then finally, direct manipulation. It's a great way, again, to minimize complexity and avoid a lot of the controls, a lot of the Chrome that you have by allowing users to directly manipulate the data, directly manipulate the content. Right? So we're going to go into that uh, principle at some point as well in the future, direct manipulation. So I normally show this page. If you haven't seen this, uh, this is our list of cognitive biases. Uh, it's arguably my favorite Wikipedia page. Uh, you should really look it up. There's a lot of really interesting biases there, and many of them are actually principles that are relevant to you uh, for design, for data visualization, for UX, but really anything. Uh, it's just a great way of getting to know the human mind in a, in a much more effective way. And thank you so much. Uh, again, 32 minutes, uh, give or take. Uh, this is our fourth section session on, on design principles. Um, if you want to know more about future sessions like this one, the, arguably the best way is to follow me on Twitter. My handle is MSLima, M-S-L-I-M-A. And that's probably the, the best medium that for you to again be notified of events. Uh, I will be doing a few things down the line when it comes to webinars, interviews, panels, and so on. So please follow me there if you haven't already. You can also, of course, follow me right here on Crowdcast. The best way is you can see that little green button at the very top of this interface saying follow. If you click that, you're going to be able to follow me as the name implies, here on Crowdcast. And that's also another great way to be notified of future events. Um, so if you haven't done that, please do so. And thank you so much. So I now I'm going to open the floor for, for some QA, which is always fun. All right. So. Let me see what's going on here in the chat because it's really hard to like have read the chat while presenting. So gamification, yes. Um, yes, and Amada points that gamif gamification has its flaws for sure. Absolutely. I was able to survive in Spain where I use internal support. Apple Watch menu. That's a great point. Darshan points to the Apple Watch menu. That's a great. The great example of progressive disclosure. I actually didn't think about that one, 
but maybe I'm, I can include it in, a, in another session like this. Absolutely. So, all right, so we have a couple of questions, one by Natalie uh, that has two votes. Would you say that progressive disclosure is a natural way to solve the problem stated by X law? Absolutely. I think they go hand in hand. I think X law points us to a, a definitely a problem, you know, pertaining to cognitive load and the amount of information we can process and some of the anxiety and stress that's caused by having too many options. Progressive disclosure is one, it's not the only way to solve X law, but it's a great way to solve it. Now, having said that, you know, even before you try to resolve a given situation with, with progressive disclosure, right? Specific one that we have too many options. The first exercise should always be trying to minimize them as much as possible. I can recall examples of having a menu, let's say, with 20 different options, right? with 20 different uh, controls in a given menu. Now, of course, you could say, hey, we could take those 20 options and use some sort of a progressive disclosure mechanism where we might group them, and then we show you know, the three or four high-level groups and then subgroups, et cetera. But you could probably do that. You know, but even before you try to do it in such a way, you probably need to ask yourself, do we need those 20 options, right? Is there a specific need for that? Like, or could we actually find ways of decreasing the number altogether, right? And then once there's nothing left to take away, right? As the great design principle says, as the, the great mantra, when there's nothing left to take away, then I think you can definitely consider an approach like progressive disclosure and others. There are definitely other things you, you can do. Uh, you know, direct manipulation is another great approach for, for doing this, that it, it allows you not to show all the CTAs uh, calls to action, all controls, all at once. But there are other approaches. But I would definitely argue that progressive disclosure is one of the most effective ways to solve X law. Now, the second question we have from Anton: um, What can you say about the challenges inherent with the smaller real estate of, say, Apple Watches in regard to progressive disclosure? Yes, I think that's a great example. Also, because the constraint is even higher on what they can show, right? And I think some of the constraints, when we talk about constraints, right, and we talk about X law or even Orovacui, or when we think about too much information, I think there's two things always at play. One is the limitation of the technology itself and the limitation of the human mind, right? So those are always two things that you need to take into account. And, you know, many times here, because again, we are talking about cognitive science and cognitive behaviors and human biases, we tend to talk a lot, a lot more about the limits of human perception and human cognition, right? And that's definitely the theme of this series. Now, there's a lot to say, of course, about the limits of technology, okay? So the limit starts with the space that I have, right? I am showing you something. Uh, we are using a screen that's pretty fairly small. You know, it's less than, it's what, I don't even know, like 60 centimeters wide by 30 high. There's a, an implicit limit to how many things I can show in an understandable way. Not only that, but of course, the computer has to process a lot of this information, right? And do that in a way that's effective, that doesn't cause glitches, you know, that doesn't cause, cause problems to the end user, right? So again, even if you wanted to display one million nodes on a screen with all the these edges, even if you had a superhuman, an alien that actually could make sense of it, it would probably cause a lot of technological problems, right? You would also need a supercomputer to do that, right? So you always, what when you're doing some of these principles, not only are you helping the user, you're always helping the underlying platform, right? Because if you do something like progressive disclosure, as an example, it's easier to load, right? It's faster to load, it's easier to consume. Uh, it just doesn't take that much time, uh, that much power to actually display. So everyone wins. It's a win-win situation. The human wins, the technology, the machines win as well. So it's really important for us to understand that as well. And again, it's, it's also good to, this is also a really important convincing argument when we are talking to partners, you know, so if we are part of a team of engineers, uh, of data scientists, as to why we should adopt some of these underlying design principles is that it's not just good for the end user. And that of course 
should be an argument on its own, but it's also use it's also usable usable for the platform, right? It's it's more accessible, it's more usable, it's faster to load, etc. So the limits of technology and the limits of the human mind. You always need to balance those two things and use them in your favor. Again, as ammunition, when to defending, when to creating an argument based on some of these principles. Oh, so Anton says, I was thinking of progressive disclosure that starts on one device and expands on another, like your cell phone that is near your watch. Yes, that's, a, I mean, I think that's a really interesting, it's, it's actually not a very new, type of concept. Anton, like I recall even back in Nokia, we had a lot of these ideas on this transitional types of user journeys, right? Where you maybe you start a given journey or like a task in one device, then you go to the other one and, and vice versa, sometimes even including two to three devices. I, to be honest, I haven't actually, I haven't seen a really good example of that. Um, there's been some examples, but like actually completing a given task, specifically it's a, a complex task, it's really hard to do that. Again, attention span, all that. It just, it's, you haven't really seen a lot of good examples of it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't pursue it, that it's not worthwhile or anything like that. I think it's definitely something that we can consider and we should explore. I just haven't really seen positive examples of that approach. That makes sense. Cool. So, thank you, everyone. I don't think we have any more questions. This was a this was a, a quick one. Um, and uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I want to thank you all for attending, uh, and I will see you next week. And again, the next uh, principle is a bit of a surprise. So who knows what will come up? But join me, and you will know uh, in a week. So it's next week on Wednesday. Uh, at 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, U.S. All right. So thank you so much for attending. It's been a pleasure. And stay safe, everyone. We're going to get through this together. All right. See ya.